The doctor said I had no control over the right side of my body. That sucks. I thought, is it over? Done with? Hell no. I want more than that. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 158 of the Stroke Cast. And happy Stroke Awareness Month if you're listening to this in May. This episode is sponsored by the fine folks at Modus Nova. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. And by the fine folks at Like Minded. To find out if Like Minded can help you live your best post-stroke life, visit strokecast.com slash Like Minded. In the previous episode, I spoke with Maribeth and Danielle about how Sophie Salveson influenced expanded practice. This week, we hear from Sophie herself. She and her mother, Maribeth, join us to talk about Sophie's journey from stroke at 19 through 10 years of recovery to looking at the next phase of her life now. The three of us discuss Sophie's aphasia. Aphasia is a language processing issue, a a communications disorder, and it is fairly common after stroke. You see, there's a lot that goes into speaking. We have to have a thought. Then we have to decide to express that thought. Then we have to convert that thought into vocabulary, grammar, and language. And then we have to manipulate our breath, our vocal cords, our jaw, our tongue, and our lips to actually say those words. There's a lot in there and a lot that can go wrong. Ten years ago, Sophie couldn't speak. At all. I mean, she still had all her thoughts and feelings and emotions, but she had no way to get them out. People with aphasia may have no words, or only a couple of words, or they may use the wrong words. But the thoughts and ideas are solid. They haven't become dumb or stupid or lost any intellectual ability. They've just lost access to their words. That's it. They're sort of locked up in another room. Can you imagine for a moment just how frustrating that must be. 10 years of speech therapy and recovery got Sophie to where she is today. She still struggles, and yet she has come so far. I had a delightful visit with her. So now, let's talk with Sophie and Maribeth. Maribeth and Sophie, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. I'm really excited about this conversation. Yeah, so are we. Yeah. (laughs) We're glad to be here. Let's jump right into it. Sophie, what was your life like before your stroke? I was 18 years old and I attended college in Chicago. I want to be a writer, poetry, short stories, and I was writing, writing my script. I like to sing and act. I like taking pictures, and I loved reading books so much. Life was normal. And that sounds like a great way to be starting off yeah. your college career. I know. And that next phase of your life. Yeah. So what happened that day that you had your stroke? I finished my run on the treadmill on a Friday night, and I stumbled. I tried to stand up, but I couldn't do it because my right eye was blanked out and my right side wouldn't work. I couldn't speak, and I couldn't comprehend what happening. The doctor said I had a global phasia, but I don't know what that was. It means that I didn't comprehend what anyone was saying, and I couldn't speak. 
The doctor said I had no control over the right side of my body. That sucks. I thought, is it over? Done with? Hell no. I want more than that. And and yeah. that is such a great approach yeah. to being in the midst of this, to be able to to think, no, nah, this isn't it. There's got to be more, and I want that more. Yes. Mm. Yes. So, so how did you get from collapsing on the treadmill to the hospital? Were there friends who called an ambulance or? Um, I don't know how. Was, I don't it, know. was it just a bystander? I think it was yeah. somebody that happened to be there. Yes. Saw her fall. Yeah. And called, they called the ambulance. Yeah. That's uh, not how you want to spend a Friday night, but. I yes. know. <laughs> I know. A lot of college kids at that point are collapsing from just an excess of partying, not yeah. an excess of I trying know. to improve their bodies. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you're going through this experience and trying to figure out what's going on around you, not being able to speak, not being able to really understand yeah. what people are saying. And happening at 18, I mean, <laughs> do they know why this happened or what caused the stroke? The doctor in Chicago didn't know what happened. Back in Nashville, Dr. O. Duffy at Vanderbilt figured it out that I had a tear in my carotid artery on the left side that made a blood clot that went to my brain. Okay. Yeah. That's quite a thing. A lot of yeah. folks, and when we say a tear in the carotid artery, those of us in stroke world know that the medical term for that is usually a dissection. Yeah. Meaning that yeah. the surface inside the artery tore apart from another layer in there. It causes turbulence, which causes clots, which then goes to the brain. A lot of folks outside stroke world, when they hear that, they think what they saw on Criminal Minds or NCIS and somebody cut the carotid artery from yeah. the outside, yeah. which yep. doesn't cause a stroke, but it causes you to die in a few seconds. Yeah. So those tears inside the arteries are, you know, can lead to clots. We often hear that about the vertebral arteries, which go up through the bones in the back of the neck. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are the ones that can get torn from rapid neck movement, chiropractic adjustments, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So a carotid dissection is, it's something that can happen to anyone of any age. And once that throws a clot, that causes all sorts of things to go, to go wrong. Yes, and, and actually what we were told uh, when, the, when they did discover that's what it was, they called it a spontaneous tear, which really was sort of a fancy way of, or obscure way of <laughs> saying, we have no idea why this happened. Like there's not a clotting disorder. There's yeah. not a tissue disorder. I don't know how accurate the statistic is, but we were told that up to 25% of young people that have strokes fall into this category that's sort of mysterious. They don't know why it happens, but that's, that's what the cause was. Marybeth, what happened uh, in your life when all of this suddenly happened? You weren't planning on this. No, no I don't think anyone plans on this, do they? <laughs> you're, you're suddenly, you f wake and find yourself in this alternate reality and nobody's ready for it. One of the first sensations I remember having is how amazing it is that the world just keeps turning and life just goes on and your world has sort of stopped. 
but you know, they, we, we had sort of a trek to make because she was in Chicago when it happened and we were in Nashville, Tennessee. And so when they first called us, we had no idea it was anything this serious. You know, they just said, your daughter fell on a treadmill and has been taken to the emergency room. And we were like, oh, good grief. <laughs> her brother went to see her. You know, it was him that first realized, no, something big's going on here because she's not talking. So it, it, it all happened and unfolded really, really fast. And it was a fast education because we knew nothing about stroke, certainly didn't know that young people could have a stroke. But I think that sort of worked in our advantage to, yeah, in our advantage to, in a way, because we, we weren't prone to go, to sort of script out the future because we knew what happens with a stroke and we knew what that, how that normally plays out. We didn't know anything. So we, we were able to sort of keep the future really blank and just be really hopeful and, and also not, not really let anybody else try to write in a future for her, which we had a number of people try to do that, try to say, well, you know, this is what happened to her. So this is what her future is going to look like. And we just never, we never did that. We just always thought, no, this is for her to write in. (laughs) And, and she has, she's done that brilliantly. You know, she's, she still works every single day and it's 10 years later and she still sees gains all the time. One of the things you said that really sticks with me there is the idea that when something like this happens, when this traumatic event happens, the world keeps turning Mm. despite our world coming to an end. Yes. uh, As, as we, as we, as we knew it, when I had mine, I ended up in the hospital for a month and, Somehow or other, it didn't stop. The world didn't stop on June 3rd. Uh, <laughs> it just continued. And then suddenly it w- I was going home and it was July. And I'm like, wait, what happened here? Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can't, can't everybody just wait and see what I'm going through? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was. I remember having thoughts like that because we were, you know, this happened uh, March. What day did it happen on? March 1st or 2nd? It was, it was in the first part yeah. of March. And I remember, you know, so we... All of a sudden, we picked up one night, put a few clothes in a bag and headed to Chicago. And I did not come home personally for seven weeks. <laughs> so I, I had to buy clothes. I remember walking to the hospital every day to and from our hotel room and watching the trees bloom because yeah. it was spring mm. and thinking, oh, I, I guess Spring is still going to happen this year, (laughs) even though our life is turned upside down. So it's, yeah, it is a surreal Mm. sort of experience, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And and Sophie, you you really got cheated out of having a spring break. (laughs) I know, doesn't it? (laughs) So, uh, so Mary Beth, I mean, you know, going through this, you have this time stop and not stop and I mean, what's been the toughest part of going through this experience with Sophie? How do I choose one? I, I think maybe the toughest part is that as a mother, watching your child have to suffer and um, face things that even you feel you yourself have not yet faced experience limitation in ways that you can't even comprehend and to have to go to bed every night and be in the dark by herself while she thinks about her life and makes these decisions as a young woman, like she was barely even out of our house. So one of the most challenging things for me, I think has been these last 10 years have been from my baby leaving home. So I still very much had, you know, she, she just left the nest mentality to now she's 29. And so I'm constantly having to remind myself that although she still lives with us and she's working towards her independence, she, she is a young woman. And, and there are parts of my brain that arrested, you know, I, I, 
because she went away to college, but then she came back home as dependent as a baby again, it ignited a lot of those things in my motherhood that now I'm having to consciously really pull myself back from and, and let her step out there and not be protective and just instead sit back and relax and sort of marvel at the person that she has become. It is astounding. I mean, if she had, you know, she was quite, we were just talking about this. She was quite the singer and the actress for about a minute. She contemplated leaving high school and like going to New York or something and trying to make it on Broadway and and decided she didn't want it that bad. But I could not be more proud of her. Now it's, it's there watching her go through this and master the things that she has mastered, master her own mindset and determination and all of that. It just exceeds what I could have ever imagined she was capable of. And, and Sophie, especially in those early days when you're living with, with global aphasia, you, you can't commute, you can't speak the things you want to say and you're not, really even understanding what other people are trying to say, but you have all of your thoughts just as powerful, all of your emotions just as powerful going through this trauma and your ideas and your thought process and all of that is still happening inside. And I can't begin to imagine (laughs) how frustrating and angering that must feel to not be able to share that. Yes. Oh my God. I'm just frustrated life just uh anyways <laughs> but now i'm getting there and uh finding how to talk so much easier and i i don't mean to keep throwing these curveballs at you <laughs> but at what point did your aphasia start to let up to the point where you could understand what people around you yeah. were saying. I don't know time at all. Just did, well, did you feel yes. did you feel that Sorry. you could understand what other people were saying? Yes. yes. Really quickly or did it take years? Or was it just so incremental? I don't know. 10 years Sorry. is long time ago oh, hard, hard to remember yeah i'm so, so sorry <laughs> no, no you never have to apologize for telling your story yeah well i can um, i can say from my perspective that yeah it seemed like it did take years years <laughs> like like there were some things that she yeah would understand and you know she's very intuitive like people with aphasia they it's amazing their nonverbal communication skills become like this superpower. Like they, they just sort of go through life intuitively. They read people's faces. They read, they read the room. Yeah. And, and so we would always be surprised when we would all, all of a sudden just say something to her and realize that she wasn't understanding what we were saying. So, so it's really, it is really hard to say when she started being able to just really hear people and understand, but, but, but I would say that it took probably years. Mm -hmm. When you left the hospital and went home, did you know why you had been in the hospital to begin with? Uh, I did. I did. Oh, definitely. I did. I knowledge that perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. While you were in the hospital, there's a lot of stuff going on and there's a lot of therapy. And for a lot of people, it's very stressful yeah. and yeah. a dark time. Yeah. But there are bright spots for many folks. Yeah. What was your favorite memory of your time in the hospital? I don't remember her name, but I had a speech therapist that I loved. I was nervous and overwhelmed, but she get me. She treated me like a human. She gave me hope and she 
was funny too. And laughter is healthy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ha ha ha. A lot of us can get that laughter yeah. matters. Just and there is joy that happens. And I think for people who care about us and for who just come to visit us and see us, a lot of times they have trouble laughing. Yeah. Or sharing a laugh with us. But the experience is so funny and so absurd sometimes. I was joking that turning over in a hospital, rolling over in a hospital bed as a stroke survivor is harder than rolling over a 401k. <laughs> wait, 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 which considering your, your, your age, Sophie, you probably never had to encounter rolling over a 401k, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> or just the sheer absurdity of having, I wait, I have to call somebody to help me go to the bathroom. This is tough. And this is, this whole thing is just an absurd type yeah, of thing yeah. to have, but this is life now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's scary too. Just anyways. No, you're right. It, it, it is scary. And yeah. sometimes laughter is how we help deal yes. with fear. We do a lot of laughing. <laughs> Lots of laughter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I understand also, uh, you've talked about the importance of reading and writing in your life and you love to read. How did you go ahead and start reading again? Actually, my sister, Chloe, recommended a book called Shatter Me. <laughs> I love my sister so much. I want to read it just to be make her happy. Before that, though, I had to learn how to read again. I worked really hard. I had to relearn all of it every time. I had to practice the sounds of every letter. I practice reading child books and it sucks and it was awful but now i can read anything and i loved it yeah that is fantastic <laughs> was do you recall a particular moment where you feel that reading clicked in your head, meaning that it turned from just it letters on a page to actual words and meaning? Maybe two and a half years ago, I woke up or kind of realized, realized how this reading just happened. Well, you were, you were yeah. reading text. Yes. Like on your phone, like yes. she would read little texts, oh, just God. one or two sentences. Yes, but to read, read. Right. The thought of reading a book was yeah. really painful. Yeah. Because it had been her life. Like she loved yeah. reading, lived in a book. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it, that was gone. And now she could, she could sort of force her way through a book, yeah. but it was not what it used to be. Yeah. It, it was like the joy of it was gone. It was all hard work. But I think what you were saying about when Chloe asked you to read a book, yeah, because it was for her, like you yes. wanted to make her happy. Yes. And so you tried it. And I think it was at that moment that she was like, Oh, wait, I can, <laughs> I can do I this. can read. <laughs> yes, I can actually I can do read this. again. Yes, two years ago. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, about two two or, and a half. No, two and a half. Yeah. So I mean, that was a good solid seven and a half yeah. years of speech therapy before Ugh. she got to a a place where she felt like she could read. But it did keep happening. Yeah, and it, and it still has kept happening. Yes, the improvement. I mean. And that's important in a lot of ways. First of all, I can hear the joy in your voice <laughs> at talking about that. That is, so, that is so important. Yeah. 
the other two sides of that is that it's incredibly frustrating to be robbed of that passion yeah. for seven and a half years. Mm. But the other side of that, especially for somebody who is living this experience the first time and is worried if I don't get it back in six months or 12 months or 18 uh -huh. months, it's gone. Just gone. It took you seven and a half years, which sucks. But <laughs> it did come back. Recovery yeah. does happen yeah. in sometimes major ways. And that is huge. I know. Uh, what types of things are you reading these days? Especially enjoy fiction novels. It's hard to read books written in the third person because remembering names is still typical. I like books written in first person, but I'm determined to read third person. So I'm working on it. I have read and listened to more than 130 books in the past two years. <laughs> yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> that That is a huge I know. deal. And I know. That's, and that's awesome to be able to be part of all of those different worlds. Yeah. So which do you find easier to consume? Audiobooks? Or uh, paper or digital books? Listening books, because there is a main author or author is this voice is awesome because, uh, how to describe it? Is it because they're sort of acting it out? Yes, yes. Sparks yes. your imagination? Yes, yes. But I like... Oh, I loved reading. I it's hard to choose. I'm well, and they're really such different things, aren't yeah. they? Because one, you're you're using the skill of actually reading the words. Yeah. And with the audiobooks, you're using the skill of listening and comprehending what you're hearing. And yeah. so there's so many parts to language I had never thought of until she lost her language. <laughs> yeah. And now, you know, I mean, I, ha I had never thought of the fact that thoughts are not language dependent. Yeah. Like people with that have lost their language still have filled out complex, beautiful thoughts. They just aren't able to put them in language. And uh, so that was a, an important distinction that yeah. I realized early on. Uh, as a complete tangent, I think there's a fascinating field of study that looks at different languages around the world and how your available vocabulary mm. influences how you perceive the world. Yeah. Mm. If yes. your language does not have a word for a particular color, for example, people who speak that language often will not be able to distinguish that color oh, from wow. other things because the brain mm. has not been trained for that. And the interaction of how language shapes our brain and our brains shape our language mm. is just such a fascinating space. I know. That really is. That is, yeah, it's like you have to have the context. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. It's beautiful. Wow. So, Sophie, do you have a favorite author this month? Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh, that's and a hard thing. Um. Well, well, let's make it a little easier then. Yes. Who is one of your top three favorite authors? You don't have to pick number one. Just okay. anybody who's in that group. Um, ooh. That's, she's looking at her book. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Called Elsewhere by Gabrielle Zevin. <laughs> that's a hard name. Yes. Yes. It's fantastic. Just FYI. Um, and... Oh, I'm listening to a good girl guides to murder. That's, <laughs> I know. I know. I that title. <laughs> I know. It's true. Um, but it's so good. I'm shocked. Yes. By Holly Jackson. 
you've come so far over these last last 10 years. You've skipped your 20s. Uh, so now as you're approaching your 30s, what are your uh, your next adventures? Well, I'm writing a new script called My Moving Parts. It's about a group of people, their late 20s and 30s. And there is drama, mystery, death, humor, tricky relationships, and more. Best part is the main character had a stroke like me. When her best friend suddenly dies, she tried to find out what happened. And along the way, she finds her life again. My dream would be to have it made into a TV show and that I could play the leading role. But right now, I'm working on my speech skills. My voice feels awkward and I'm working on the flow. Well, that's great. Well, I hope somebody from Netflix or Amazon or the studios is listening and wants to talk development. Yes. I, <laughs> one of the other uh, great things is we're also seeing this greater interest in actors with disability and writers with disabilities. Yes. And I know uh, Maggie Whittem, one of our previous guests, has been very active in that community, especially in Denver. And so there's a lot of great things happening there. And I think if you've, uh, for anybody who's a fan of the TV show Psych. Oh, um, yes. There, Have you seen the last two movies, Psych 2 and Psych 3? No, oh, but I want to. They're They're great. Especially because Timothy Amundsen, yeah, uh, the uh, one of the one of the main actors, he experienced a stroke, uh, and his appearances in the second and third movie are post-stroke, and they lean into it with his character. So you get to see him experience his hemiparesis and adjusting to his identity. Oh so, my god. Uh so yeah, and he does an awesome job and it just sort of hits me right in the feels to to watch him talking about driving and whatnot. Oh my gosh. I want to watch it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know you do. Okay. <laughs> So, Maribeth, I mean, as you've been watching Sophie go through this over these over this last decade, I mean, what are you most proud of in her recovery? Well, gosh, so many things. But, um, I mean, one of the main things is, you know, anyone would understand finding yourself just being so angry and sad and and feeling like, why me? I mean, that all of those are completely 1,000% justified. And And I know she has felt that. Gosh, I have felt that as her mother, you know, but she has figured out how not to stay there. And, and I guess this is, this is the thing that I'm most proud of is her incredible will and persistence at recreating her life because it's no small thing. You know, it's, it's not just that you had something bad happen to you with a stroke you lose your identity because your brain is different and your body is different. Like everything that you know to be you is suddenly different. And so you have to find yourself again and recreate yourself. And she has done that. And I know, you know, she's had like anybody would those times where it's like, if I could quit, I would. <laughs> But I can't. I mean, she was so young and I think she realized, you know, I've I've I can't quit. I've I've got to keep going. And as you can as you can hear in her voice, she is a joyful, charming, fun, intelligent person. And and that could have gotten lost along the way. And it didn't because I think she I think 
In recovery, you must have to learn to love yourself so tangibly, like I will not let go of these parts of myself on purpose, because if you're just sort of reacting to life, they do fall by the wayside and rightly so. But um, people that don't lose those beautiful parts of themselves, it's because they have intentionally hung on, you know, with their teeth to who they really are in the core of their being. And I think that is, that is what just makes me I, my heart just bursts open when I think about what she's been able to do. And, and that was all her. That was stuff that nobody else could do for her. Uh, it was all up to her, and she has done it brilliantly. Uh, <laughs> maybe. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you've done it. <laughs> well. well. I was going to say, those first 19 years pro- of, uh, <laughs> uh, and that environment of her first 19 years probably played a part in that. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> so, uh, and that brings us to our hack of the week. But first, let's talk about sponsor Modus Nova. Modus Nova can help survivors recover the use of a stroke affected hand or foot. The system helps you get in the reps you need at home when you aren't going to see an occupational therapist or physical therapist. The Modus Hand and Modus Foot are AI-controlled, air-powered robotic exoskeletons that you can wear while doing exercises by playing video games. They make it a lot more fun to get those reps in. To find out if Modus Nova can help you recover the use of a stroke-affected limb, visit strokecast.com slash Modus Nova. Use promo code STROKECAST for 10% off your first month. And now back to our hack of the week. It's hard to think of the words and hard to talk, but you have to keep trying every time. It's that, that sounds like a plan. <laughs> I know. Is there but anything yeah. you do when you go out in the world to communicate with people around you? I'm going out makes you nervous because I'm kind of mad of my, not myself, but of everything. Yeah. There's a lot to be mad about in the way that a lot of people have been in the outside world over these last few years. It's so tiring. Just get out to the world and I don't know. Try again. Yeah. It's tiring. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. But you do it. Just have to do it. <laughs> I hate it, <laughs> but not hate it. Well, I, we'll see. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Yeah. When you look back on all of this uh, over these last 10 years or so, and, you know, the tremendous adventures you have to come that you never planned on, was mm-hmm. having the stroke a blessing or a curse? Both, actually. The worst for me is not having the life I want. I lost most of my friends. I spend so much time doing therapy. I want a job, but it's hard to find one. But there is a blessing because I'm here and I'm grateful for being alive. Also, Closer than ever with my family, especially (laughs) my mom. (laughs) I'm sure she would have liked to lose me years ago, but (laughs) (laughs) fate fate stepped in and, and wow, I'm surprised. No, no crying. I know I made it through this without crying and I'm, we're we're all in shock. Good job. (laughs) That is fantastic. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Well, if you have questions for me, message me on Instagram, Sophia Elise, or email me at sophiasalvesongmail.com. And also, almost six years ago, there was a short 
film made about my life called Still Sophie. It was made by Caroline Knight and <laughs> Chan, uh, Chad McClarkin. McClarkin. That's right. Oh. Close. Shoot. Chad McClarkin. Almost there. <laughs> Great. I will have all of those links in the uh, in the show notes as well, so folks can head over there and check them out and uh, and follow up and reach out. Great. Yay. So, Maribeth and Sophie, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. This has been an absolute delight. I have really enjoyed this and getting to hear your story. And, uh, yeah, it's been great. That's it? <laughs> Just <laughs> joking. I <laughs> That's that's it. We that's can come it. back for part two. <laughs> well, or part three in this series, and we can absolutely get deeper into some of your work and some of your reading and Ooh. all of that stuff. I'd love. I know we'd love to learn more and continue to be part of your journey. Oh, thank you. Oh man. Well, we really had fun talking to you today. Yes. Bill. Yes. Thanks for having us on the show. Like minded is our other sponsor this week. Like-Minded helps you get the support, knowledge, and connection with other survivors that you need and deserve after stroke. Led by occupational therapist Jane Connolly of Heal the Brain with Jane fame, Like-Minded is a nonprofit membership program offering virtual classes from OTs, PTs, doctors, creators, and other survivors to help you live your best post-stroke life. Members also get access to session recordings and to a private text messaging group for even more support. To find out if like-minded is right for you, visit strokecast.com slash like-minded. Use promo code strokecast to save 20% off your first month. One of the most important takeaways from this conversation is that Sophie's favorite moment from her hospital experience was the speech therapist who treated her like a human. And I, I think it's awesome that she had that experience. And I'm horrified that the experience was so rare as to be so memorable. The reason being treated as a human stands out so much is because she did not feel she was treated that way by others. Feeling comfortable with our providers and, and feeling as though they treat us like humans and not just a work project or condition should be the bare minimum that we expect from them and not an extraordinary highlight. But many times it is. Another thing that jumps out in this conversation is how much of Sophie's goals, plans, and passions revolve around language. The very thing that became a huge issue from her stroke. Reading, writing, acting, and singing all rely heavily on what we can do with language. At the same time, they also all rely on different parts of the brain. Writing a script pulls from different parts of the brain than reading a book does or acting out a scene. The way they pull in executive functions or the motor cortex or the auditory cortex or the visual cortex while centering in language can only help the brain leverage additional resources as recovery progresses. Another thing I really want to point out that's that's pretty amazing is Sophie's singing. Uh, in the conversation, Maribeth mentioned the documentary Still Sophie, uh, which sort of tells Sophie's story from a couple of years ago. And in that documentary, you get to hear Sophie singing. It actually opens with song. I'd encourage you to head on over to strokecast.com slash Sophie, where you'll find links to that video of Sophie singing. She has an absolutely amazing voice. And it's not that she has an amazing voice for somebody with aphasia or somebody who's recovering from a stroke. It's that she just has an amazing and beautiful singing voice, period. Uh, I can see why she certainly had uh, her eye on Broadway, and I could certainly see her performing on the stage at some point. It just absolutely amazing. So definitely go ahead and check that out. What I also find is really fascinating about this is how singing itself functions differently in people from speaking. 
In fact, one of the things I've been told is that one of the ways to treat people with aphasia is to encourage them to sing songs they know, things that are buried deep in our minds like Happy Birthday or other songs from childhood, or even to just sing their name or sing a greeting or a response to a question. You see, once you engage the brain in singing, it sort of bypasses some of the traditional language functionality and can give you some really surprising results, such that singing can become easier for some folks than speaking. The power of music itself is just, it, it's just this whole other thing. A, a couple of years ago, uh, we talked with Brian Harris of Med Rhythms. He's been working on a solution that involves sensors that monitor your leg and your foot as you walk and are able to communicate with a device that plays appropriate music. And by adjusting the music, he is able to help people have a smoother gait. It actually improves their walking because there is this connection in the brain uh, between the walking and the auditory cortex that sort of bypasses some of the errors and damage in the motor cortex. It's some really fascinating work at how music interacts with the rest of the body and the brain and the other challenges we live with post-stroke. And I'll have links to that episode as well over at strokecast.com slash Sophie. Another thing that jumps out in this conversation and I've talked about this before. I've talked about uh, the importance of SMART goals, setting SMART goals to uh, drive your recovery or really anything in life. Uh, a lot, these are things that a lot of times therapists will set up as part of a, a therapy plan. SMART goals are typically simple, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. All five of those elements are important to be able to achieve a goal and define a goal that makes sense. I mean, it's a structure that's super common in the business world and the sales world as well beyond the stroke world. But I want to talk for a moment about the R, and that is relevant. Your goals need to be relevant to your life to drive what you want to accomplish. So for example, if an OT had wanted me to learn how to swing a golf club, I mean, that might be good exercise for the shoulder and for hand control, and it involves how you use the fingers, how you use the wrist, how you use the elbow, uh, how you manage your core and rotating and balancing. And it's probably a really good exercise to be able to swing a golf club. And if they had set a, a, a goal for me of being able to swing a golf club, it probably wouldn't work. And I just wouldn't recover that because I don't care about golf. If I never have the ability to properly swing a golf club again in my life, it makes absolutely zero difference to me. Heck, before stroke, I never had the ability to properly swing a golf club in my life. So, I mean, why would I dedicate the brain power and the energy to make that happen? I, I mean, I could try just in the vacuum of recovery, but... Ultimately, it doesn't connect. It doesn't matter to me. It's just not relevant. Now, typing, on the other hand, is another matter. Or possibly riding a bike. Or getting up and walking around a stage. Or, or any number of things. You see, the tasks we work towards need to be the things we care about. Or we simply won't have the energy to work towards them. Life is too short to focus on learning to do things that we have no need or interest in doing. In Sophie's case, it was wanting to have a deeper connection with her sister that made the difference in recovering her ability to read a book. That book, of course, was Shatter Me that Sophie talked about. I mean, sure, Sophie already had a passion for reading before her stroke, but it was that personal connection that sort of pushed her over the edge and really made the difference. Connection among family members and partners and friends drives many people's recoveries. And one of the cruelest things about stroke is how it attacks those connections, altering and fracturing relationships and preventing folks from making new connections. When stroke makes it harder to get out of the house or to talk, or to maintain energy at a social event, or to type, or to go to work, 
or any number of things, it isolates survivors. In-person support groups, online groups, stroke-related podcasts, YouTube channels, and more are all ways that we are all striving to add more personal connections in our lives. And rebuilding reading skills to be able to read a book is one way that Sophie could connect with her sister at a deeper level over a shared passion. To learn more or check out the resources we mentioned or to connect directly with Sophie, check out the show notes in the app you're listening to this on or visit strokecast.com slash Sophie. Be sure to share Sophie's story with someone you know by giving them the link strokecast.com slash Sophie. Subscribe to the Strokecast newsletter by visiting strokecast.com slash news. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.